Your Excellency, Minister of Finance, Heng Sui Kheer. Um, India's first comprehensive economic cooperation agreement was in large part a labor of your convictions, your perseverance, uh, and your professional negotiating skills. And what we hear can do from you even now in terms of your faith in the partnership, your emphasis on the geopolitical and the economic significance of India-Singapore partnership gives us great confidence going into the future. And it is indeed a great honor to have you here today on what would be the 25th anniversary of CII Core Group here, but even more to deliver the first CII annual lecture here in Singapore. So thank you for being with us here today. We will soon, of course, have uh, eminent senior minister Go Chok Tong, and no history of India, Singapore, or India ASEAN relations can ever be written without assigning a central role to him. And to this day, he speaks with a candor that can only come from honesty of genuine friendship and from concern of a great, true well-wisher. Uh, so we look forward to having him here. Uh, to Mr. Rakesh Bharti Mittal and the CII team that is over here, I can hardly say welcome to you since your roots are deeper here than mine. And CII has been here longer, perhaps 10 times longer than I have been over here. But nevertheless, um, a warm welcome to all of you. To all the eminent people here, I'd love to take all of your names, but then we'd be sending the rest of the evening. But your presence is a remarkable testimony to the importance of this event and to the central role that CII has played in building this partnership. It is indeed a very special moment here today. Uh, this is a year of milestones. We've had 25 years of ASEAN-India uh, uh, relationship. We've had 25 years of CII core group, and we've had 25 years of Singapore-India bilateral mar maritime exercises, the naval exercises. And all of these uh, milestones are in some sense linked to each other. In 1990s, at the turn of 1990s, at a time of this great change taking place in the world, India opened itself to the world. And with instincts that were honed over centuries of uh, links to the region, we retraced that ancient route uh, to this region. It wouldn't have been possible without, of course, the extraordinary role that Singapore, and in particular, ESM Go Chok Tong played, not just in supporting India's economic reforms, but also in being an intellectual, economic, political and diplomatic bridge between India and this region. It was also CII which in many ways opened the doors of opportunities and possibilities between India and the region, between India and Singapore. But even more interpreted the changes, political, economic and social, that was taking place in India and that would be the key driver of the change that we have taken, seen in India and in our relationship uh, with this region. So much has changed since then. It is hard to imagine how distant we once were, despite our connected histories. And in the course of these 25 years, a few statistics speak for themselves. Our trade has grown from about a billion to about 20 billion, though all of us would agree that it is far below potential and nothing to yet uh, feel wonderful about. Our Singapore accounts for now 16% of foreign direct investments into India. 20% of India's overseas investments come to Singapore. That makes both of us leading sources. For India, Singapore is both a leading source and a destination for investments. In every area of our development priority, from smart cities to skills, uh, urban solutions, uh, to infrastructure. Singapore is a major partner. 500 flights connect the two countries every week, and that is reinforcing proximity and connecting businesses and people more closely with each other. India is today the third largest and the fastest growing source of tourism into Singapore. And I think our share in tourism spending is higher than our share in tourism arrival, which shows you how important Indian tourists are in this country. 
but we've embarked also on a very exciting enterprise of technology and innovation. India's digital revolution, which in the course of just a few years has touched more than a billion lives, and Singapore's leap into the future of finance has created a foundation for a remarkable partnership in fintech. But together we have sought far more from technology and innovation. We're seeking solutions that inspire hope and transform lives of the poor, the weak, and the vulnerable, not just in our parts of the world, but in solutions that can be replicated elsewhere. The Indian professionals and diaspora have provided an extraordinary spark to ignite the startup ecosystem here in Singapore. And together we are building now an extraordinary digital bridge between India and Singapore, between India and through Singapore into ASEAN. And all of this is happening within the comfort of outstanding and deep and strong political relations, free from any contests and claims and conflicts, filled with goodwill and trust, an excellent defense partnership that for both of us is among our strongest, and our ties of culture, faith, and festivals that in intensity and quality would rival any major city in India. But as we look to the future, these 25 years have been a great journey. But I think the strategic imperative of our partnership is going to be even more compelling in the decades ahead. And Indian industry, as it has done in the past, will have to play a very important role. For one, I often think that if we have to be, as India, a global player, then we must also have global champions in the Indian industry. <laughs> History has shown that no country has risen to global heights without their corporates also being great global players. And therefore, when we think of Act East policy, when we think of Indo-Pacific region, our vision and our strategy would have, needs a very strong economic pillar. And as much as what we in government have to do, the industry also has to do its own part. To raise our share of trade in ASEAN from 2.6% and our share of investments into ASEAN from 1.5%, which it is currently. And therefore, when we speak, when we look at the region, it isn't just important for us to think of opportunities that we can we can project that exists in India, but see how we can use spring Singapore as a springboard and a gateway, not just for the ASEAN, but for the broader East. And already, I think um, Singapore is home to 8,000 registered Indian companies, and so many of the CII members have extraordinary participation here, but we need to raise that level significantly. The second, of course, is that when we look into the future, when you think of Singapore, Singapore is looking at a, at a future that is going to be driven increasingly by the digital connectivity and digital economy, and so is ours. And our natural complementarities of resources and skills, of Singapore's pension for efficiency and ours for innovation, create a perfect ecosystem where we can work in areas of Industry 4.0 for SMEs, for startups, for innovation and for the entire partnership in digital economy from fintech to cyber security. And because the digital connectivity is growing, location has ceased to be of such great importance as it used to be in the past. The third is in the realm of research and development. This is an area where India is still at 0.94%, less than 1% of the GDP on R&D, and that simply won't do. And when we break the zero point, that one percent of the GDP that goes into R&D, the industry still accounts for a fairly small proportion of that. And this is something we need to raise. To be a leader, we need to either do things differently or do different things. And as in the case of manufacturing, in the case of R&D also, there is now a global value chain that moves across the board. And this is an area where I think Singapore and India can do a lot together. Singapore has already emerged as a major R&D hub. 
its universities, its uh, One North, its Fusionopolis, Biopolis, you can talk of any of these areas. There are great innovations up and there are great opportunities to work together. And the next important thing is that we need to take a strategic, long-term, economic and geopolitical view of our economic engagement in this region. And that means that we need to think also of how we are going to be part of what is going to be the most dynamic re economic region of the world. A region which has all our major partners, China, Japan, ROK, um, and ASEAN with its 650 million people growing an economy growing at 4 to 5 percent a year. And for that it is important for us and for the industry also to speak up for initiatives like RCEP, the Regional Co Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. There are ways, there are details we can work on, but we need the support of the industry to send a message that it is important to be part of this initiative. And finally, whatever we attempt to do, it can only be done through connectivity. And we have to think whether our arrangements for bilateral airlines or bilateral aviation agreements must be based on the interest of airlines alone or aviation ministries, or it must take into account the broader economic interests of the country, of the states, and of cities uh, that are part of this great stream, which means we have to look at trade, investment, and tourism. So it isn't just the responsibility either of the government, it isn't just the ownership of the aviation ministries. It isn't just of aviation authorities, but it must be something on which the industry must also speak uh, in one voice. So there are, of course, traditional areas where we can work together. But I'd also say this for Singapore. Singapore also needs to do a lot more. They need to be bolder. They need to be more ambitious. They need to be able to take higher risk. I understand the constraints of a small country, but many of my friends here have told me of the opportunities they missed because they were too conservative in making their choices. And this is something I say because we all know that India is growing at seven point. You've had Mr. Mittal better position than I am to speak about the growth. But numbers can be fickle. Yes, we are growing at seven, seven and a half, eight percent, we will. But we all know numbers can be fickle, they can be cyclical. But what is important is that the underlying determinants of demography, of politics, of policies, of governance, of resources, of the transformations that are taking place in the cities and in digital world and in the rural areas and villages, of the scale of change and ambition and of the speed of implementation that tells us that all parameters are coming together to sustain high rates of growth in India long into the future. And it is a growth that is going to be inclusive, regionally balanced, and environmentally sustainable, fiscally responsible. I mean, this is the parameters on which, regardless of where we are in terms of who rules and who doesn't in, in Delhi or any of the states, that's the direction. And when we look at the world around us, of all the tensions and of all the shifts that are taking place, it is important to bear in mind the importance of India and the attractiveness of India. There is no better infrastructure story in the world today than India. Not just because of the grandness of the ambition, but because of the speed at which and the scale on which it is being implemented. So we need to be a little bolder. We need to take more initiatives. We need your help, people like Ascendos, to tell the story of all the successes. We don't hear great stories about Indian successes very often here, about the opportunities. And that deters a lot of people from going there. So it is as much not the credibility of those who have succeeded in Singapore will matter from Singapore will matter more than what we say. The third is that we do need to create, I know it is not as easy to work in, 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 as in Singapore, or culturally as familiar as being in China, but we need to create India-ready talent. And there's something which I think CIA has taken a wonderful initiative to work on. We also need to harness what I think is perhaps the world's most professionally outstanding Indian diaspora. 
you will not find in 50 square kilometers the quality of human resources anywhere in the world that you would find from India in Singapore. Deeply familiar and connected with India, deeply supportive and committed to Singapore, can act as a great bridge between, between our two countries in informal and formal capacities. And finally, I think what we need is also to do an annual India forum here. A forum for two days that focuses our mind on the opportunities of India. And we did one ASEAN India Overseas Diaspora Convention, which was less to do with diaspora, but more with ASEAN India. For two days, we had 16 outstanding business sessions and a whole lot of other activities. And that told me the kind of potential that we actually have over here. Because why it is important is because the next 25 years, as I said, is going to be far more important for us than the previous 25 years in India and Singapore partnership. If you see what is happening around in the world, and if we want to build, create opportunities for our future, reinforce our economic growth, make our economies more resilient, reduce the risks that we face, but even more important, if you want to create an Asia, Indo-Pacific region, or or this Asia that is mirrors our ideals, that mirrors our vision of inclusiveness, openness, stability, and prosperity. India and Singapore need to do that with greater purpose. Thank you very much.